From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. And welcome to Jack Van Impey Presents. What the headlines have to say to us today are absolutely astounding. And this first one, I think we need to really zero in on because we see it everywhere. In the churches, everywhere. Prophesied apostasy. Here now, that's a very good question. As we mentioned a moment ago, the churches, oh, how they need to be preaching the truth to all of us. And then number two, deadly terror attack strikes Tel Aviv market. You know, when you do something like that, you touch the heart of God because the Lord loves Israel. And so we need to be praying so much for them. And then three Christians vanish after assault by Muslim extremists. They're gone. They don't know where they are. And so they are searching for them to see if they can find out. We'll elaborate on that in a moment, too. But we do want to just say we trust that all of you will especially zero in on the 4th of July, putting out the flags and saying what a great country we have. In fact, I think my dad was the first one on the street to get our flag out. And he taught us a wonderful, wonderful song, God Bless America, Land That I Love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. We need to be looking to the Lord in this very dark hour for our country. But, oh, I love America. And I mentioned last week, Jack, we've been in 50 countries. Yes. Your relatives yes. live in Belgium. But every time I came home, I wanted to kiss the ground, didn't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love Belgium and my relatives. And they're really suffering now under Islam. In Belgium, you know, they just had that terrific thing happen at the airport. And now my cousin wrote and said they're passing out pills, radiation pills, for something they're planning to do to the Belgian people. Pray for them. Thank God I live in America. But I am heavy hearted for my precious people in Belgium. You know, all this, though, Jack, to me, seems to point to the coming of the Lord. And that's good news. I love my country, and I thank God that I was reared here. But uh, the apostasy and everything we're seeing certainly does point to the return of the Lord. Now, just before we came into the studio, Jack handed me the Inside the Vatican magazine cover. I'd like for you to take a look at it, and then I'm going to turn it over to him because he will explain it. Yeah. The Vatican magazine has Benedict's resignation transformed the papacy? Well, Jack, you wanted to explain this, I believe. Oh, Rexella, you see the picture on the screen there of the two popes, Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis? I'm telling you, I was going to do an unbelievable thing and make this an explosive program, but there have been some hindrances. The 10 things that this new pope says and does that is against your Catholic Bible. And he doesn't accept much of what's in the Catholic Catechism. I'll prove it all. But I want to thank God for Pope Benedict XVI. He retired. Why? Because the Muslims were going to put him to death. Because he said something against their religion. Well, they went to Pope Francis and said, Look, we will restore fellowship and we will be with you and sponsor you if you will do one thing and get up and say, the Muslim people are not dangerous. They are a religion of love and peace. Well, if Pope Francis did that, he'd be a liar because it isn't so. And I'm here to tell you what the truth really is. 
and I'm not going to spare anything. I don't spare a president who never tells much of the truth, and I'm not going to spare a pope who's not right. Now, St. Peter, the first pope, made this prediction in 2 Peter 2, 1. There were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying Jesus that bought them. As you're going to hear today, Pope Francis is on dangerous ground. And poor Benedict had to resign, and he's living under death threat. Remember that you pray for him daily. I will take the 10 things that this Pope is now doing against that catechism and against his church. And by the way, look up point 841 this week in your catechism, not just the little part at the top, the whole page, where this Pope says, oh, you Muslims are going to be in heaven with us because of Abraham. You're not going to get to heaven because of Abraham. He's not the savior of the world. He was a sinner like others, and he had sex with a woman and bore a special son called Ishmael. That wasn't a holy event that happened. That's not what I'm going to talk about, though. I'm going to show you from the Bible that Abraham went to heaven because he received God and Jesus as his Savior. And that's the only way you're going to get there. And there won't be a Muslim there who believes the Quran because in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 11, 13, and then over in chapter 19, verses 33 and 88, Eight times it says, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you believe in a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you'll burn in hell forever. Now, does that sound like this crowd's going to be in heaven with us? Come on, use your thinking apparatus. Not only that, but our Bible says in 1 John 2, 22, Whosoever says that Jesus is not the Son of God is an Antichrist. And you know, soon, oh man, the signs are here. The Antichrist is going to appear, and there's going to be a false prophet with him. And according to Bishop Sheen, he'll be one of our cardinals who would defect from the faith. Malachi Martin was the man who wrote all the books against the Jesuits. He was a Jesuit and said, I can't be of communist, Marxist any longer. I must leave the movement. And boy, he wrote 10 books, 6,000 pages a piece, where he really tore the Jesuits apart, including this man called Pope Francis. You know, I was just uh, listening to what he had to say there about Abraham going to heaven. He will be in heaven because Jesus was the fulfillment of the Passover. The Jews of the Old Testament took their lambs shed their blood to cover their sins and look forward to the Messiah. And Jesus came, the Lamb of God. Well, how wonderful to know that those who were practicing the Passover of the Old Testament will be in heaven because of their looking forward Ooh, to the Messiah. Right, Dad? Oh, okay. Moment. They would shed the blood of animals to pass over for their sins so they could get to heaven, but it wasn't good enough. So Jesus came and took a body and shed blood for our sins. And when John the Baptist saw him in John 1, he says, Hey, there's the Lamb of God who takes away sin. And from that time onward, every person who trusts in Christ could go directly to heaven at the time of death. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Let's Amen. move on now. Here we yeah, are. we got a lot to do here. Right, we do. Well, have you noticed something? A tremendous change in the Christian community. You know, I've noticed young people don't talk about their faith very much. They're almost afraid to. And behind the pulpits, they're not saying very much about what they can to help these young people to be forward about what they believe and free about how they believe. Astonishing things that are happening. Here we are, perhaps today. While the world applauds Pope Francis, the darling of the secular media, Dark latter-day prophecies are being fulfilled. You and your family deserve the truth. Here we are. Prophesied apostasy here now. 
Don't let your friends and family fall away. And then what is the rapture generation? Whoa, that we all need to hear. And then we receive so many letters from people who say, thank you for helping us to understand the Bible. Here's one. My spirit is uplifted when you talk about the coming of the Lord every week. Now, there are about three points I want to ask Jack about what I just read to you, about a falling away. First of all, um, I think that we should uh, be talking about that word that uh, our friend wrote about, the rapture, the coming of the Lord. Jack, quickly give us that, will you please? What is the coming of the Lord? I'm sick of these Christians who don't want Jesus to come and say, ah, we don't believe in the rapture. That'll never happen. And especially the pre-trib rapture that would go up before Armageddon. That you're going to get something from me that God gave me in the last couple of months, and I have to repeat it. I get so excited about it. The signs are given in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 17 and 21. Now let's go to chapter 24, beginning with verse 3. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you be in trouble, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many, because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the world, and then shall the end come. Now that's not the end of the world. For it's a world without end, Isaiah 45, 17, and Ephesians 3, 21. It's the end of the church age. We won't need churches anymore or popes. Why? Jesus has raptured his people, and now they're returning with him to earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. And now they call it the kingdom. The church age will be finished. Anytime you come to that term, end of the world, as I said, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of the church age as we go into that great hour when we live with Christ on the earth. Now, here's where it happens. Are you listening? That's uh, over in Revelation 3.10. He says, I will keep you from, not through, preservation, from, out of the hour of temptation and testing that shall come upon the whole world. That's when we're released and we're taken out to miss the greatest and most horrendous time in the world. Well, where do we go? That's 310, 41. Come up hither! And we go to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the twinkling of an eye. Our bodies have been in the graves. We've been in heaven in spirit form, and now the body and spirit's reunited. And we're with Jesus and come with him back to earth. And you say, can you prove that? Chapter 1 is the prediction that we're going to miss it. Chapter 4 shows how we miss it. And then in Revelation 5, Verses 9 and 10, they're singing a song, oh boy. They sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God, kings and priests. And we shall reign with you on the earth. They've come back. And... That's because of a pre-trib rapture. Now that rapture could never happen until Israel became a nation and captured Jerusalem. They had not been a nation for 2,000 years since 70 AD, but they came back in 1948 and took over Jerusalem in 1967. And that's the sign and everything that's been happening, the weather and finances, 
ties in with the sign. We're the first generation that can see it because for 2,000 years they were not Israel and they were not in Jerusalem. Now, what is the rapture? People say, ah, I don't believe in that rapture stuff. Then you'll never see heaven. Why? There are only two verses in the Bible that talk about the resurrection of the dead. Do you believe you're going to raise, you're, come out of those graves? Yes. You won't if there's no rapture. They're the only two verses in the Bible that tell us that the dead are coming up to get their bodies and then return with Jesus. And I'm not going to even get into 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, because I have a purpose here. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 54, where Jesus said, I show you a mystery. Now, I use that one purposely because the word mystery means it's the first time anything has been mentioned in the Bible. So this is about the resurrection of the dead and the rapture. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, be dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we, the living, shall be changed. For this corruptible, the dead must put on incorruption. This mortal living must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal immortality, then shall be written that wonderful saying, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I've been raised from the dead because of the rapture. Oh, Jack, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Don't you love that? That's good news in light of everything we have to give you week after week. The Lord is coming back. Now, you know Dr. Jack Van Ibby, Dr. Billy Graham, Dr. Franklin Graham, Dr. Robert Shelton. I, I wrote down just a few names. Dr. Criswell, Dr. Jeffers, and when Adrian Rogers was alive, he also preached on fundamentalism. Now, you know, friends, you have to have a basis to believe something. You've got to know what you're believing before you can believe it. And so fundamentalism, let's take a look, please. I'm going to ask Jack about fundamentalism in just a, a moment. Here, liberating a continent, Pope John Paul II, and the fall of communism. Of course, he certainly was trying to keep his church from going in the wrong direction. Here we see it, Pope Francis at a press conference. Religious fundamentalism must be combated. What? It is not religious. What? God is lacking. What? It is idolatry. Oh, Pope. What religious leaders need to do is convince people who have these tendencies. Fundamentalism that ends in tragedy or commits crimes is a bad thing, but it exists in all religion. Fundamentalism doesn't cause all that, Pope. I'm sorry to say that's not true. Temple Mount preacher calls to annihilate the Jews, as I mentioned. When you talk about the Jews, you touch the heart of God. His son came to that nation. And then deadly terror attack strikes Tel Aviv market. Come and kill four Israelis wound five at tourist spot. Now I just want to quickly ask Jack, Jack two things and we have to combine this. Our time gets away from us so quickly. First of all, what is fundamentalism quickly? And then what did Pope Francis do when he went to Palestine about the Jew? All right, Jack? I'm going to answer the second question first, Rexella, about the Pope and Palestine. I will have the Roman Catholic Reims Doe version here to show you that this Pope doesn't know what he's talking about many times, and I mean that. I will not use the Protestant version. I will use it to show that the King James Version is the same as the Reims Doe version. The Catholic and Protestant Bibles alike. Praise the Lord. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, it says, The Lord did not choose you, Israel, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest, but because he loved you. Get that, Pope. I saw you sit there in the Holy Land recently with the Palestinians, with the Muslims, and you shook your fist and you said, I want to be the Sheikh of Vera of the Palestinians. What for to kill the Jews? God forgive you. God loves those dear Jewish people. He says they are mine elect, Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, 65, verses 9 and 22. He says, she is my fiancé. 
I'm betrothed to Israel, Hosea 2.19, and she's my bride, Jeremiah 3.14. Shame on any Christian who hates the Jew. I can't stand this replacement theology of you Protestants. Let me show you how nonsensical this replacement theology is. 2,604 times where the Bible uses the term Israel, they call it the church. Boy, is that great teaching. And every time Jerusalem appears, it's heaven. Bunk! Get a good Bible and study for yourself. You can't get by with that because it would mess up everything about Christianity. Let's go just a little farther then. What's the five points of fundamentalism? In 1929, the Protestants got together and says, we choose these five points. Unless you believe these five, you are not a Christian. We don't care what else you believe. These are the five major things. Number one, that Jesus Christ is a deity, that he's God in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Secondly, he was born of a virgin, and that's Matthew 1.23. Thirdly, that he died on the cross, and there is no other way to get to heaven. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God and salvation. Fourthly, that he rose from the dead. He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It's all there. And number five, he's coming again. He comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Revelation 1, 7. You don't believe that? You're lost. Get saved. Oh, Jack, I love it. I love it. You <laughs> must believe that in order to be saved. Well, now, friends, quickly, I'm going to read something to you. And it is amazing because it's all about the Pope, Orthodox Catholics have discovered that this far into his papacy. They are uncertain whether Francis truly believes in the teachings of Jesus Christ on the vital moral issues of the day, teachings the Pope is duty, bound to promote, protect, and proclaim in season and out. So what fruits of this papacy can we see? We see dissent, disunity, and confusion. We see cardinal aligned against cardinal, bishop against bishop. We see open advocacy of heterodoxy, a denial of the concepts of sin, admission to the sacraments without conversion, forgiveness without repentance. In other words, salvation without the cross. We see an open attack on church teaching from within our highest offices, what some have called the smoke of Satan. And I'm going to ask Jack if you will just sort of put this all together, analyze it quickly for us. Oh man, it is the smoke of Satan and you're going to see that smoke fly. I will tell you the ten things this Pope has denied. It goes against the Catechism, goes against the Catholic Bible, does not take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Saint Peter the first Pope was right when he said in 2 Peter 2, 1, there are false prophets among the people as there shall be false teachers teachers among you who privately, secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying Jesus that bought him. You know, the last part of what I just read, salvation without the cross, really got to me, friends. There's no salvation without the cross. We must look to the cross and ask Christ to be our Savior. Will you do that right now, please? Ask the Lord to come into your heart as Jack prays this prayer. Jack. There's only one way, that's the old rugged cross. Take a look. Do you see Jesus on that cross? Do you see the nails in his hands and feet? Do you see that precious, holy, efficacious blood flowing? Without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that washes us from all sin. Right now, would you pray this prayer? Do you see Jesus on that cross? Look at him mentally. Jesus, I trust in you, wonderful Savior. Thank you for the precious blood you shed that can get me with you in heaven and then back on earth forever. Lord Jesus, this day I receive you into my heart as my own Savior. Come in, Jesus, and thank you. 
Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. There's my address. Write to me, please, and let me know if you opened your heart to the Lord. Isn't it good to be forgiven, to be cleansed by the blood of Christ? I'll send you this little booklet, First Steps in a New Direction. If you'll just let me know that you have asked the Lord to be your Savior. Oh, how we'll praise the Lord for that. We have a wonderful, wonderful offer for you that um, you really need to pay attention to an order in just a moment because it's Jack Van Impey answers 35 most outstanding questions about Christianity and Bible prophecy. You got some questions? You need to really have this because it'll answer all of them. And when you order this, I'm going to be sending you, will it happen this year? Oh my, oh my, it could happen this year. Now here's our announcer to tell you how you can receive Dr. Jack Van Impey's answers to the 35 most startling questions about Christianity and Bible prophecy. Chuck? Thank you, Rexella. Oh, my friend, to order, have your credit card ready and call toll-free 24 hours a day, 1-800-JVI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, NINA6Y1. Now, once again, here's Rexella. Thank you so much, Chuck, and I just want to encourage you to make the call. You really need to have this wonderful offer, and don't forget, I'll be sending you a gift. The wonderful Will It Happen this year, and of course, Jack is astounding when he goes right ahead and explains all the things in the Bible pertaining to the coming of the Lord. I want to leave you with something that we've been talking about. If we could earn our salvation, Christ would not have had to die to provide it. He's the only way. And now I want to say, as I always do, we look forward to being your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. So do we, so very, very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>